So everybody, thank you for uh, coming to the privacy talk again. I'm uh, very honored to have a call with Michael this time from Silicon Valley. Uh, he's a uh, great entrepreneur. And uh, for Sophia, I was very honored to have a call with you this moment. Thank you for Michael coming. Well, it's my great pleasure. And thank you for finding me <laughs> for making this very interesting broadcast about a very important topic. Yeah. So first of all, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, his profile. Uh, he's a managing director, founder of Heroic Ventures, and the executive chairman, the founder of Liquitation.com. Heroic Venture is the leading Silicon Valley uh, venture capital firm focused almost exclusively on first money and formation investing. Liquitation.com is the world's leading company in digital reputation. Michael was named Entrepreneur of the Year by Tech in America, an annual award given by the Technologies Industry Trade Group to an individual they feel embodies the entrepreneur spirit that made the US technology sector a global leader. He is a member of the World Economic Forum Agenda Council on the Future of in Internet, a recipient of the World Economic Forum Technology Pioneer Award, and through his leadership, the forum named Reputation.com, a global growth company. Eric is an industry commentator with a guest quorum in Harvard Business Review, Reuters Inc.com, and Newsweek. But again, it's uh, great to have you uh, this interview, uh, Michael. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I want to move today's agenda. I'm um, one of the fun of your philosophy on the internet. So you have started your company, Liftation.com. And uh, this is the one of my uh, mission as well. I'm using a social media as the internet to build up my limitations. Uh, mm. So I, I want to ask you about the, your history, the why you established these companies uh, with uh, strong passions. Thank you very much. Uh, well, we have to go back into time. I started this company in 2006, which is already a long time ago. In 2006, if you can imagine, MySpace was much bigger than Facebook. This is all some kind of ancient history in the internet. And I realized that this new business of broadcasting your information was going to change the way we lived. I realized that it was going to give us interesting opportunities to meet and collaborate as you and I are doing now and, uh, and find people to marry and find people to work with and find people to share interests with. And I also realized it was going to cost us some of our privacy. And I also realized that the consumers the users of these products did not, did not understand. They did not understand. And still today, many do not understand that they are the product, that their information is the product that the companies are selling. And then when I looked at the internet, I said, well, if you look at the first quantum of wealth, trillions of dollars of wealth that was created on the internet, 90% of it was advertising. And advertising on the internet means they give you something free, they take your data without your knowledge or permission, mm -hmm. and they sell it to someone you cannot identify for a purpose you can never know. Mm -hmm. That's the business of the internet for the first 20 years. And I said to myself, this is a problem. This problem will get bigger. I had philosophical reservations about it. I had personal reservations about it. And I had commercial 
reservations about it. Mm -hmm. And my opinion was that there was going to need to be some antidote, some response, some medicine. And I went to, I went to law school and I had a background also in technology. And I realized that probably the solution to this problem was going to come from a combination of law and technology. And in Silicon Valley, often we don't like to think about law. Uh, we like to think about technology and so-called technology solutionism, meaning we solve this through solution, uh, technology solutions. And of course, I believe in that too, but I also understand the power of the law. And I started the company. Now, when I started the company, uh, the so-called intelligentsia, the so-called uh, think, thinking elders of the internet mm -hmm. thought that I was wrong. They thought that my idea was against the zeitgeist, was against the idea of the times. Mm -hmm. And they used to say things like information wants to be free. Information wants to be free is a beautiful idea when you're talking about health data or academic research, or uh, perhaps you might believe uh, political information, for example. But it's kind of a cavalier, kind of a unwise cavalier flip, casual idea when it comes to your bank account mm -hmm. or your personal health or your dating history or your child's grades. And so, um, I knew it was untrue, but I had to fight some very, very powerful people who had their very powerful microphones. And one of the most powerful groups of people in this area were basically Google and Facebook. And, and the, the Congress of the United States believed at the time that the mm -hmm. internet was Facebook, the internet was Google, and they believed that Facebook and Google could do no wrong. And the people from the Clinton administration were coming from Google and the people from the Ad Obama administration were coming from Google. So there was like this revolving door of these people who had one idea and they were supported by some people in academia. So I was very much alone. I was very much alone in my idea, but I was early and we were right. And I kept saying it, I stayed calm. And over the years we did change the conversation of the internet and it was very difficult. Uh, there were times in the early days when I would sit on a panel, a moderated panel, and mm -hmm. uh, I learned a trick that the other guy on the panel, who was so-called against privacy, mm -hmm. would use. Um, and after a while, I learned the trick and I said to the moderator, I said, I have to be on the panel, but I have to, I will go on the panel, but I have to go first. And you'll understand the trick in a second. I said, I'm very happy to be here. I'm Michael. This is what I believe. But I also want to say something to you. If anyone on this panel begins the talk by saying we have to define privacy, then we know this person is lying. And this person mm -hmm. does not want to have a conversation about what privacy is or what their company is doing for privacy. That is how you know they're lying. That is how you know their agenda. And all of a sudden, if I said it like this, then the other guy could not say, we mm -hmm. could not ask the question, we have to ask about privacy. And so we, we were able to change the conversation that way. But there was a whole set of deceptions around what is privacy, and so because we all know what it is. We all know it's about your personal information. Um, and then we, we also had to do a lot of battle with a, a kind of group think, group mm -hmm. think that was very strong in the Clinton administration, also Bush a little bit, but a lot in Obama in the early days which was there are two parts of privacy on the internet. One is data collection and one is data usage. Mm -hmm. And in America, because of these policymakers, the White House and Congress, White House really was ready to give up on data collection and focus only on data usage. Mm -hmm. And this was a mistake in my opinion. And Europe understood this, by the way, Japan understood this as well that this was a mistake. So they focused both on collection and usage, but we had to fight this argument in the United States as well. And eventually, eventually the world changed their mind. The world realized that there is no such thing as a neutral default setting. Mm -hmm. There is no such thing as some 
uh, okay usage of your data without your knowledge. This contract where you're using the, the website so they get to do whatever they want is not a real contract. It fails in law, it fails in practicality, it fails in ethics. So we have to do it better. So I think we changed the internet. Um, but I will say there are other democracies around the world that were also alive to this, that we're aware of this. Japan is a very strong or, or, or had a very strong privacy framework compared to the US. Europe developed one uh, because these countries have different, especially in Europe, I think they have very different histories with private mm. data and how this can be used by the government and other parties. So unfortunately, this story is not over, but it's getting better for the privacy people. Mm -hmm. And now the culture of the cool people, the intelligentsia, the culture of the cool people has, has, has changed. Now it's about blockchain. It's about secret mm -hmm. contracts. It's about preserving data, preserving privacy control. And this is very good because actually it's not a new idea. If you ask the guys who created the internet, maybe they're in their 80s or 90s now, you ask them, what, what did you get wrong when you created the internet? Some of them will tell you that they, they failed or they forgot to create the identity layer mm -hmm. of the internet. And the identity layer, it might sound like you need to show your face and your thumbprint every time you go to the internet. That's not true. The identity layer can be fully anonymous, mm -hmm. but for something very important, maybe for shopping or you're sp spending money, you, you need your name and your... ID uh, for something very private, like health information or weapons, God forbid, you need something more secure and more special. But you could imagine that the internet w could have been born mm -hmm. some decades ago with a middle layer that required some kind of identification, even anonymous identification. Mm -hmm. And this would have given the power to you instead of to the companies. Mm. This would have given you the power to control your data and to monetize your data. And they forgot that. They, didn't, they did not do that. And that's a mistake, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree that you were saying that identity is uh, uh, empowers the individual since I, I've been working in the blockchain space this three years. Uh, the, we are stretching our extension to the identity layer, which is the key part of the upsetting, not just the remains, the centralized control. It's the basic concept of decentralized identity. Uh, because of <clears throat> those essences of the enhancement of the individual to use your data for any specific purpose based on their consent, which is the ideal for all of us to do on the internet. Is that mm -hmm. not just uh, it's not just a kind of the abusement of the internet at this moment, I guess. That's a power is a requirement for all of us to do. Um, for that point, I was very inspired from the, your book, The Next Reputation Economy is the very, um, very futures for us uh, because the internet has uh, given powers for us to control our identity before and uh, we can build up our uh, reputation through the processes, but even the internet, we have a different context, such as the U.S. your own internet, then China has their own internet, Europe has them, Japan as well. Um, so, in terms of the reputations in the futures, so how we can um, see in this context the differences, how we can take an balance in each com countries. Well, I think that what you're working on sounds very important and uh, also very brave. And I hope that it works. Um, from the sound of it, it sounds very uh, terrific. And, I, and based on what you told me, I hope it works. Um, well, uh, yes, cultural context and legal context, and maybe even national context, still matter somehow in the internet, even though the internet is supposed to be borderless. Um, Perhaps in some places like China, where they have really kind of a closed internet, um, it's perhaps impossible to say what will be possible. Uh, 
it, it appears like the government has, even by its own admission, uh, nearly perfect control over their internet. Um, I don't think even Russia does uh, have the similar power yet over their internet. Um, maybe in some other countries, maybe this also happens. Um, but China has really been very uh, intentional about this. I have visited China over the years, and in my experience, um, the internet has gotten tighter uh, in China, uh, more closed, more controlled, not more open. Uh, I think that the policymakers in the West believed that if they engaged with China, uh, one of the things that would happen would was a kind of openness of the economy and of uh, the political sphere and um, uh, the social and digital spheres. And I think we probably have learned that this is not happening, that we were wrong and the opposite is happening. Uh, and I probably predict right now based on this, uh, this uh, global pandemic and the, uh, the antipathy that will happen between China and the rest of the world because of this virus I think this is going to create more pressure and the pressure response in China will be for more control, not less control. So unfortunately, it seems like China is a sort of its own case where privacy is almost impossible on the internet. Um, I, I, don't, I don't have this impression about Japan. Um, Japan does protect privacy a lot. Actually, even this very uh, big system uh, in, in Japan, I think you call it the, the Ponta, the Ponta system mm. is a kind of uh, mechanism to protect privacy, actually, um, because it's it's anonymous, actually, right? So, it's uh, you have also a culture of privacy in in Japan, um, I think, uh, and uh, and it seems to me that you also have a culture in Europe of privacy. And here in America, we have not the same kind of level of culture of privacy, but we have an expectation of privacy. We. Mm. We believe that it's more of a, we still have the old cowboy idea that uh, <laughs> my, my land is my land and your land is your land. Oh. And um, my life on my land is my, pri my private affair. Um, I think that's a beautiful idea, actually. It's a beautiful American idea. Mm. So our idea of privacy comes from somewhere else. It's not the same idea, I think, as it, does, as it comes in Europe and perhaps in Japan, it comes from a different place again. In America, it comes from another place. Um, but um, philosophically, one thing uh, is consistent around the world, which is uh, a reason to protect privacy and probably is the reason that the Chinese government does not want to protect privacy of individuals. Mm -hmm. um, what is privacy at its core it is the armor, the cloak that allows you to explore who you are and allows you to know yourself. Mm. If you want to be cynical or if you want to mislead people or if you want to be dishonest, then you say that privacy is a way to commit crimes. Of course it's not. Mm. Of course it's not. Secrecy is a way to commit crimes, mm. but secrecy also allows you to do other things, build things in secret, collaborate secretly. But privacy at its core is those set of privileges or rights that allow us to know ourselves and to explore ourselves. And perhaps on the internet, you need privacy most of all. Perhaps on the internet, you can research uh, something about sexuality, Mm -hmm. But you don't have to be afraid that now the people think that you have a different sexuality. Uh, maybe it allows you to research some uh, controversial politics. Mm -hmm. And uh, everyone is allowed to look over the edge. Everyone mm -hmm. should be allowed to look over and see what's going on over there without being afraid of being accused of being uh, a, a fascist or 
a communist because you read about it. Um, and maybe you want to research something about divorce or you want to research something about a disease and you don't want people to wonder what's going on. And so the, we should be allowed to try on, try on different things. And um, every culture has a way to enable this. Um, mm. in, 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 in Japan, you have some culture I have, I have read about, for example, uh, where the, the employee can become, can drink a little too much and then <laughs> say some things to the boss, for mm. example. So this is a way for us to allow people to do something different and, and, mm. to, and to express themselves. Well, you don't have to, we don't, we don't have to get drunk to express ourselves uh, mm. in every way. And, and the, common, the common thread of, of humanity is that everybody wants to think about something different. Mm. Mm. Maybe you live in a Christian community and you want to think about Islam or some really other idea of Christianity, Catholicism, for example. I don't know. And you don't want to tell anyone yet. These are things that are understandable and they are forgivable and they are part mm -hmm. of being a human being. And the, the threat of surveillance, the threat of surveillance, even private surveillance, is that you never get to be mm -hmm. the person you want to be. You never get to understand yourself. You never get to explore something. And you never get to explore it in order to reject it as well. Mm. Right? How many times have you tried, for example, um, uh, 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 a beer and you decide, oh, I've tried the beer. Now I don't like that beer. I will never have that beer again. Okay, that's, mm. that's, that's exploration. <laughs> or some tea or some origami or some, uh, or some brand of tissues for your blowing your nose or a pillow for your house. Who knows? These are ways that we can explore that sound funny, but there are also very personal ways to explore. And uh, these can be very dangerous mm -hmm. areas if we believe that someone else is watching us. Now, privacy is not the same as secrecy. And mm -hmm. we, we need in our world the ability to find bad people and capture them and prosecute them and put them in jail. Mm -hmm. and. That there is a way to do this uh, with legal mechanisms that can open certain digital doors to mm -hmm. allow uh, those people to go to jail. Um, but there should be some heavy burden, mm -hmm. uh, a very heavy burden to access those kinds of data. And this is not a controversial thought. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. As an investor on your side, I have a, one paradox that I want to mention about this. Uh, consumers become to take privacy. That means they will not be disclosed your information to the specific service. Is that kind of the uh, paradox of the internet? Because there are a lot of business, such as the Facebook is collecting the data. Even they are not saying for you, but they make a money through that. The problem of the internet services, if we, they want to achieve the high growth, they have to target the customers in order to provide the specific services. So this is the basic principle. However, the people is um, being threatened, the privacy, they don't want to disclose your real information is not the works in the internet business, I assume. In this sense, is, uh, from the investor parts, how the service can collect the information from the customers. I, I think this is the one way I'm always exploring. Well, it's a good question. Um, I think there are some ideas that many people have been exploring and maybe you have explored them as well. I am an investor in a browser company called Brave, mm. Brave Browser. I'm one of the first investors in that company. Mm. And Brave intends to 
turn upside down the business model of the internet. So instead of some kind of advertising fee uh, that they pay for attention on websites um, and for traffic, what they do is they allow publishers to collect directly uh, their crypto coins called mm. BAT um, uh, that, and perhaps they use other coins as well, I don't know, but I think it's just BAT so far, where you can pay someone if you like their article or like their page or like their uh, service. Mm. Small amounts. Um, I'm a shareholder in this company and I have a small amount of BAT as well, I believe, I should say. Um, but it's just one innovation to answer your question, I'm talking about it just to answer your question. It's one innovation that uh, seems to be doing pretty well. A lot of people like the browser. The browser seems to be faster mm -hmm. than other browsers because it does not, it blocks all of the trackers and the cookies that slow down, or many of them, I think mm -hmm. all of them, that slow down your browser. And it allows you to control how you spend your time and your attention. Is it perfect? Maybe not, but it's the beginning of a big story that can totally change the, the basic business model of the internet because if you control the browser experience, then you control everything else and you can control um, how, how the personal data of the user is monetized. Mm -hmm. um, because your data exhaust, your trail of history of where you go and how you go is much smaller on Brave than it is on the other browsers. So that's one uh, idea. Um, Another idea is you could imagine a data vault where the, the user specifically authorizes, mm -hmm. specifically authorizes a website to get enough data from him or her to do business, uh, to rent a film, to buy a pizza, to order music or listen to music, um, mm -hmm. stream something, uh, go into a Zoom uh, experience. So, but the, but the website does not need more than that minimum amount of information. Mm -hmm. And so you, as a user, can trade your data for a lower price, or you can say, well, I will give you minimum data, but I'll pay a higher price. Mm -hmm. It's a very reasonable trade. And then you have a very simple formula for a very clear contract between the contract between the user and the service instead of a hidden contract mm -hmm. where you think it's free, but they take everything. Mm. Uh, and that's a, that's a deceptive kind of contract, actually. Yeah. Um, it is so much of what the internet depends on, but it is unfair. So I think there are many better ways to do this, to unpack uh, the internet. And I am glad to see many companies are being born that can try this. It's not easy. There are many uh, uh, big companies that are uh, against you. Uh, but also, I think there are some companies that can be for this. For example, Apple mm -hmm. uh, can be supportive of privacy. And for example, um, I think Microsoft should be, and Amazon also. Um, and Intuit, which makes tax software, mm -hmm. can do this, I think, because they do not make most of their money from advertising. Mm -hmm. um, so they have less to lose than Google or Facebook, for example. Um, but I, 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 do think, I do think it should get better. I do think the, the, the law is getting stronger in this area. Mm. People are losing patience. They don't trust Facebook anymore. They don't trust Zuckerberg. They don't trust these companies because the companies have been misleading them for a long time. Zuckerberg, I believe, testified on Congress uh, in, on, uh, on Capitol Hill. Mm. Facebook does not sell your data. Uh, they've been saying this for years and years. They don't sell your data. But even the same, I think even if, if my memory is right, even the same week that Zuckerberg testified that Facebook does not sell your data, mm. repeating the same lie they have been repeating <laughs> for so long, finally Facebook was forced to admit that they share your data. Mm. And they share your data in exchange for value. So even though they don't sell the data for dollars, they are selling your data. In any other mm -hmm. context of the world, that's a sale. Mm -hmm. That's a trade. That's a trade for economic value. And they have been parsing, using this very specific word in a very deceptive way mm -hmm. for a very long time. 
And I think people have figured that out. Now, um, I don't agree with every criticism of Facebook, but I do agree with their crit the criticism around their privacy and their trustworthiness. Mm. Um, and I think they don't care about it. And I think they pretend to. So I do think it's an opportunity for a better day. I also think it's possible that um, so many people now spend so much money on the internet mm -hmm. that they know how to spend money on the internet. And so most of the next generation of wealth that is created on the internet is for money, not for attention. So Uber um, uh, is an example of a company that makes money through payments. Salesforce is a company that makes money through cloud. cloud. Mm -hmm. Apple makes money through payments and not really through attention. And therefore, there's more opportunity to create pro-privacy business models mm -hmm. than ever before. So I am optimistic about the future uh, because a lot of the, the work has already been done. I see. Yeah, I assume as the evidence last year in California has been a past the CPOA is the kind of the pretty democratic approach from Japanese side I seen it. Uh, is that kind of the new regulation strengthen the the superseding the C CCPA in California the last year, I assume. So from that perspective, uh, will we change the Silicon Valley ecosystem in next decades? Because you mentioned on the interviews, maybe the last years and Silicon Valley is a, a little bit hierarchies of the tech big companies is been a control of the ecosystem such as the Google, the Facebook is uh, reliable for the startup as well, just uh, M&A or other related uh, crazy relations. So it, it's gonna be the, any big movement uh, for the, the privacy protections. Yeah, the CCPA is, is, pretty, is pretty strong. Um, but, but it still is mostly about usage. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, unfortunately, It's, 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 it's pretty well done, but unfortunately, I, to, I told the chairman of the FTC after, after they made some ruling against Facebook, mm -hmm. I told the, the FTC, I told the FTC that I thought in America, we use this expression, so I'll have to explain this expression, that they closed the barn door they closed the door after mm -hmm. the horse escaped. So you can imagine the idea. The horse is running outside of the barn. Mm -hmm. And then you close the door. But the horse is gone already. Mm -hmm. right? no. so, so it's something like solving a problem after the problem is already unsolvable. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the problem could be that the law might protect the biggest companies that have the power and the money to navigate the difficulties, but it might kill the companies that were competing with Facebook and so forth because it creates a very heavy burden on them. Mm -hmm. I guess you have to start somewhere and the CCPA is, it, it makes a lot of sense to me. Is it, is it the same bill that I would write? No, but it's pretty, pretty close. It's pretty close to the European uh, protections. Um, but I, I also think that the, CD, the CDA 230 needs to be re-examined. I think it's protected these pseudo publishers for too long. And it creates a higher burden for a magazine than for Facebook, which is promoting conspiracy theories and lies all the time and making money by doing so and making money by especially promoting lies and, mm -hmm. and, and so forth. So I think that uh, we've created a, 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 a set of laws that probably made sense in the 1990s. And now it's time to change them uh, a lot, I think. Yeah, yeah, I, I have never been to the Silicon Valley so far, but uh, I'm, uh, I have some friends there they are a little bit against of the tech ecosystem this moment because it's a 
uh, very big gaps in between the people, the rich, the people in the poverty. It's a very uh, big challenge for the tech ecosystem as well. And uh, it's a little bit turning point for the big companies, uh, even they are running a business in the United States or other countries, but in Europe is against uh, because of the highly protected the personal data. Uh, is this a kind of the big turning point? So th that's why I'm wondering the, what is happening in Silicon Valley's, uh, especially the tech communities. That's a, yeah, that's a very big uh, transition that maybe for the next decades. Mm. Yeah, I, 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 um, the, 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 the concentration of wealth is, um, is certainly on a lot of people's minds. I, I will say that, um, the instinct to punish people because they have money mm. seems no wiser than punishing people because they don't. Um, I don't think we should be afraid of success or we should punish success here. Mm. Um, but I think we should create rules and ecosystems that allow for um, different ways of profiting that are um, less in conflict with mm -hmm. values that we care about, like privacy. Um, and unfortunately, we have uh, sometimes the drama of, of, the, of the moment can confuse the important topics. So um, some years ago, there was some drama about so-called revenge porn, mm. which is which is a a nasty part of the internet um, in which uh, people can put some private videos on the internet of their former lovers. Mm. And it's very nasty. Um, and no one should defend it. Um, but because there was <coughs> a lot of attention because there was a this was very this involved sex it involved mm -hmm. scandal and so it got a lot of attention but the truth is revenge porn actually affected a very small number of people mm -hmm. in the world very very small number and privacy affects everybody mm. so the 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 companies that want to use your data for their economic gain put some effort to focus everyone's energy and attention on this very scandalous mm. but very small category called revenge porn. And revenge porn was the subject of some legislation and some regulation and we can understand that. But when you when you're very when you're very clever, mm -hmm. you can focus everyone's attention on some small corner mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of the lion's foot. And you look at the lion's toe and you say, wow, the lion's toe has a very sharp nail and that's very dangerous, the lion's toe. But nobody's looking at the lion's mouth. <laughs> And the lion's mouth is what's so dangerous for everybody else. So I think th this battle is not over. And I think there's still a lot of opportunity for innovation, mm. for wealth creation. I don't share, I don't share skepticism of wealthy people. I, um, I don't share skepticism of people who make a lot of money. I do, um, I do understand it. Um, but what I really share is skepticism of people who make money a certain way. Mm. <laughs> and so, um, I think we should celebrate risk taking. I think we should celebrate mm. 
people who are willing to take risks. And part of taking risks is the risk of failure. And that happens a lot. And part of taking risks is the chance of great success, mm-hmm. which is a small chance. But everything that we value comes from that small chance. Mm-hmm. And the great success can be financial, it can be spiritual, it can be um reputational Mm -hmm. but for many people who are taking very difficult risks it will be financial and if you take away or if you punish success by taking away the financial reward or by punishing it with reputational risk Mm -hmm. just because they're successful then fewer people will take risk and unfortunately, that means there'll be less innovation and less change and less new medicine and less new devices and less new technology. And a lot of that, not all of it, a lot of it will help us. And when you take it away, you take away a lot of our, our best parts of our future. And then the people from the left, usually from the left, and I'm from the left, but the people from the left say, well, this guy made... $100 million. That's enough. He doesn't need to make more. Okay, I understand that. Mm-hmm. I understand that instinct. But I can tell you for every person like him, there are probably 500 or 1,000 or 10,000 who made nothing. And so he didn't win the lottery. Mm-hmm. There is some luck, but he didn't win the lottery. And And the people who criticize this usually are people who never really took that risk, not always, but never really took that risk. And so I, uh, I don't think this is a perfect system, Mm -hmm. but it is a system that is better than any other system we have found. (laughs) And so when someone like you, Kohai San, when someone like you takes a risk and develops a company in privacy, You do it because you believe in it. You do it because there's a chance of success. You do it because this success may bring you some financial reward, but also some reputational reward and some sense of accomplishment, Mm -hmm. some personal sense of accomplishment. And if we punish you, both when you fail and when you succeed, then you should go work at a giant bank and sit near the window, Mm -hmm. like some kind of dead wood for 50 years and then you have the problem of Japan. And so I I don't want America to become that. I don't want America to become Europe. I want, in this respect, I want Europe and Japan to become more like America and I want Mm -hmm. America to become more like itself. Yeah, that's uh, very passionate. They have to, yeah, I I, I assume that I have a mission that I have to commit to something that I have to do it for the society that's uh, my role is uh, succeeding for the next generations. Great. So, uh, unfortunately, it's a time has come. Could you give us uh, all the listeners um, to any message uh, from the, your expects, experiences and uh, that you are working right now as well as the privacy perspective? Yeah, I, I would like to, I think your audience is Japanese. So, um, is that right? It's mostly Japanese? Probably, but I also share my social networks with some foreigners as well. Well, okay. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to say that I really enjoy and love and admire Japan and Japanese culture. Uh, I have had a great privilege of doing business in Japan and uh, visiting Japan, and um, I love it. And uh, and it's a great privilege to be a small part of your Japanese story in this podcast. Also, um, I hope that everyone who is participating has a lot of confidence in the future about privacy, because this is a war that I sort of, uh, in some ways I started by myself, although there were others of course before me, 
and the way I started it, I might have started it by myself. Uh, and the, the number of us, in any case, who were fighting this war years ago was very small, and now it's much bigger. And I am so glad that so many people like you are in this battle together. And I want you to think of it not as a battle just of cost, not as a battle to, of creating cost and tax and uh, restriction, but also a battle and a war of wealth and value opportunity for wealth and value creation. It's not just a minus, it's also a plus. You can have a totally different, very attractive, very possible version of the internet and services that is very pro-privacy where a lot of wealth and innovation can occur. And I think that it is for your generation of entrepreneurs to carry this battle forward. And I think there'll be a lot of great success. You can only look at Snapchat and Snapchat where the, the photographs expire and disappear. And Telegram where it's very encrypted information and confide in all the other services where your communication is very secret. You can look at these products and technologies and companies and say, wow, now we understand there really is a market for these products. And I think this kind of innovation should continue and can continue. The blockchain, secret contracts, these are areas where you don't have to have a political point of view. You can just understand that these are valuable opportunities economically. Mm -hmm. And maybe you also have a political point of view, but you don't have to have one. So I think this is a very exciting time. The next 20 years will be more exciting for privacy than the last 20 years. And I wish you great success in all of your projects. Thank you. Yeah, that was very excitement to have a call with you this moment. And uh, I hope this message to be delivered to the next uh, challenges and uh, making a collaboration and just uh, leave it alone. Thank you for having Michael this time. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you.